In this video, we're going to talk about the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is an ultra low cost development board featuring a custom ARM Cortex M0 Plus microcontroller. This board is more in line with the Arduino, STM32, or ESP32 than it is his namesake, the Raspberry Pi. So why should we care about yet another development board? Well, at the end of the day, it really comes down to usability and cost. At a whopping $4 cost point, with banner specs like a 133 MHz dual core processor, 264 kilobytes of RAM, two megabytes of onboard flash memory, and all the usual suspects for peripherals, GPIO, SPI, I2C, 12-bit ADC, PWM, and the list goes on. This development board packs a huge punch for little investment. Heck, a proper breadboard will cost more than this development platform. Ultimately, you'll have to decide if the Pico is right for your needs or project. Let's see what it's going to take to get started. The parts you're going to need to follow along with this video are just a Raspberry Pi Pico and a micro USB cable. Just like any other microcontroller development board, we need to get a programming environment set up and running. You have several options for programming the Pico board. The two primary ways recommended on the Raspberry Pi website is either MicroPython or good old fashioned C. There's also beta support for utilizing Adafruit CircuitPython, and the Arduino team has announced they're porting the Arduino core to the new architecture as well. For me, I'll start with MicroPython now, and in the future we'll take a look at some of the other programming options. For the development environment, I'll be using the Thonny IDE as recommended by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Much like the Arduino IDE, Thonny strikes me as just enough application to get the job done. It has a main toolbar, script area, a shell, and has the Pico interpreter support already built in. Best of all, it supports CPython and MicroPython for multiple board types, as well as generic support for CircuitPython. So no matter what we want to do in the future, we should be covered. After downloading and installing the Thonny IDE, you'll need to set it up for use with the Pico board. In the bottom right hand corner, you can left click on the Python version and then select MicroPython Raspberry Pi Pico. The next thing we need to do is get MicroPython up and running on the board itself. To do that, you'll press and hold the boot select button on the Pico board as you plug it into the computer. Your computer will recognize the Pico as an external flash drive. Here you'll see two files. One is the info UFT text file, which contains information about your Pico board, and the other is an index.htm file, when executed will open the Raspberry Pi website. You can download the MicroPython firmware.uft file from here. Flashing the firmware to the Pico is as simple as copying it from your computer to the Pico. After a few seconds, the board will reboot and it will no longer be connected to the computer as a mass storage device. If you don't want to download and transfer the UFT firmware to the Pico board, another option is to let the Thonny IDE install the MicroPython firmware for us. If you press and hold the boot select button while plugging the board into the computer and then open the Thonny IDE, you'll see a prompt that provides instructions for installing the MicroPython firmware. You've already completed the first two steps at this point, so all you need to do is press the install button. The Thonny IDE will copy the required files over to the Pico, and after pressing the close button, your Pico board will be seen by the IDE and can now be programmed with MicroPython. We have two main ways of inputting a program into the Pico microcontroller. The first is through the shell, where you can input individual commands and press enter for immediate execution. This process is known as the REPL, or read, evaluate, print, and loop. The second method is by writing multi-line programs in the script area and then running the code. Let's first take a look at the shell. If we type 5 plus 5 in the shell and press enter, the value 10 is returned. It may not seem like it, but the script 5 plus 5 is actually being handled by the interpreter on the Pico microcontroller. Next, let's see if we can get the onboard LED to turn on. In the shell, first type from machine import pin and press enter. This will import the pin class from the machine library. The machine library is what does most of the heavy lifting when interfacing with hardware like the Pico. Next, type the function pin and give it two arguments. The first is the GPIO pin number, and the second is the mode we want to set. Here we're setting pin 25 as an output because the onboard LED is physically connected to GPIO pin 25. Finally, type pin 25.value1 and press enter. This will set the value of GPIO pin 25 to high, which turns on the LED. It's important to remember that code executed through the shell will not persist through a power cycle. If we were to unplug the Pico from our computer, you'd see that the LED is no longer on. We also see that the Pico is disconnected from the IDE. Next, we'll want to use the script area to write a multi-line program that we can save to the computer or Pico. However, 
we need to restart our session with the Pico board first. This can be done by restarting the IDE or pressing the stop button in the main toolbar to initiate a connection with the board. Now let's write a program to blink the onboard LED on and off at an interval of 500 milliseconds. We first need to import the machine and microtime libraries. Next, let's define an object called LED and set it equal to machine.pin with the values 25 and machine.pin.out. This will set the mode of the GPIO pin 25 as an output as before. Now we can set the value utilizing our object. The possible values in this case is 1 for on and 0 for off. In order for us to add a delay, we use the microtime.sleep function, which has a single argument that corresponds to time in seconds. Here we'll use 0.5 to give us a half second interval. With the code written, we can press the save button. Now we have to decide whether we want to save the program locally on the computer or on the Pico itself. For this example, I'll save it locally on the computer with the file name blinky.py. All there is left to do is press the run button and we can see our application running on the Pico, flashing the LED at the half second interval. We still have the issue of the program not persisting through a power cycle, but at this point we had the code saved in a .py file and can open it back up in the IDE or another text editor. To allow our program to continue to work on the Pico board without the computer, we simply need to save our program with the file name main.py and save it to the Pico board. To get all that done, make sure that blinky.py application is open in the IDE. Then select File, Save As. This time at the Where to Save To prompt, select Raspberry Pi Pico and give it the name main.py. Finally, press the OK button. The next time we cycle the power to the board, the LED will start flashing. The great news is we can now connect the board to an external power source like a USB power bank and the program will continue to run. So in this video, we went over what a Raspberry Pi Pico is, how to set up a programming environment with MicroPython, and a couple ways to input our code into the microcontroller. I have a lot of plans with the Raspberry Pi Pico, so stay tuned. Until then, thanks for watching.